Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, uh, may I go as far as comrades? Thank you all for coming to this evening's event. Um, special thanks to all our panelists. Um, tonight, I think you've made such a lovely introduction of the topic. I only have 10 minutes, so I shall be brief. Um, about a month or so ago, I was fortunate enough to get in contact with some of my friends from uh, middle school, my hometown of St. Petersburg. Um, and I asked them the same question that many of you are asking tonight. Uh, what is Putin's Russia? Or more importantly, how did Putin's Russia come to be? I got many interesting responses from my friends, but perhaps the most insightful one of all came from my friend Dmitri, uh, who is now studying economics and law in St. Petersburg University. He told me that the best way to understand Russia is through a popular anecdote, and it goes like this. Uh, Stalin ghost appears to Putin in a dream, and Putin asks for his help to run the country. Stalin says, round up and shoot all the members of your competing political parties. And the second thing you need to do is paint inside of the Kremlin blue. Putin waits a minute and goes, okay, well that's interesting, but why should I paint inside of the Kremlin blue? Ha, says Stalin, I knew you wouldn't ask me about the first part. <laughs> um, and that, in a way, is a, is a good way that Russian, it shows how Russians actually think about uh, Vladimir Putin, Vladimir Putin's rule over Russia today. Now, since I only have 10 minutes for the opening statement, I will try to cover two main points, and if time allows, I'll go into the third one. Uh, first, I will go through the recent political history of Russia and the three, so to speak, horsemen, Yeltsin, Medvedev, and Putin, uh, and trace their own footprint in the uh, evolution of the Russian state. In this section, I'll also explain the fundamental constitutional problems that are facing Russia when it comes to corruption and different institutional um, challenges. Um, and finally, if time allows, I shall conclude my exam uh, by examining the various problems in the Russian infrastructure. But everything started with the first meeting of the National Deputies on May 25th, 1989. On this particular day, for the first time in the history of the Soviet Union, the Communist Party had allowed and powerful opposition. A substantial part of the attendees formed the multi-regional deputy coalition, which began to fight for nullifying the sixth section of the Constitution of the SSR that secured the power of the Communist Party. Among the members of this coalition was the ambitious and ideologically driven Boris Yeltsin, who quickly became one of the group's leading faces. Moreover, uh, a dismissal from a government position that he held earlier for sharp criticism of the Communist Party made him a very well-recognized figure at the time. However, the total victory for Yeltsin was just around the corner, and on the 12th of December 1991, Russia exited the Soviet Union, and Gorbachev resigned shortly after. Now, if I'm to pause this brief run-through of Yeltsin's influential early history, right here and now, it would seem as if this individual was one of the most important warriors of liberty, freedom, and democracy in Russia. Indeed, as a matter of analytical honesty uh, to the account which I've just exposed, there is no other reasonable observation we could make about Yeltsin and his intentions. However, the toughest test was yet to come, for Yeltsin now had to demonstrate what he could do with the power once he actually got to keep it. It would seem logical that after the resignation of Gorbachev and the exit of um, the Republic from the USSR, the government structure and the new Russia would be remodeled to fit the ideological position of democratic reformers, However, 1991 went by and much has changed. Same with 1992. And only in 1993, almost three years after Russia's independence, uh, was the Soviet government structure finally replaced. However, this process was not a matter of a simple vote in a constitutional convention, and neither did it lead to an overwhelmingly beneficial outcome. It came as a result of yet another bloody internal revolution. Um, and the event is known as the Constitutional Crisis of 1993. What happened was the parliament, which was still largely communist at the time, um, did not really want to go along with the reform plans of Yeltsin. And what Yeltsin did was basically dismiss the parliament. He says, I will no longer listen to the parliament. Um, the entire government is now under my control. So obviously the parliament didn't go along with that. And actually for a brief period of time, they elected their own president. So for that short month or so, Russia actually had two presidents, one elected by the parliament, and the parliament also um, uh, 
So the Putin, well, excuse me, uh, Yeltsin had no power. So the country was divided, structurally torn apart, and the big question was, well, who do people follow? Will they side with Boris Yeltsin and say that he has the power, or will they side with the parliament and um, the new president that was appointed by the parliament? Well, what happened was the military chose a president, and the military joined Boris Yeltsin, and the parliament was dismissed. Um, there was a, um, a blockade set up around the parliament building which ended up in violence, several deputies were killed. Um, it was a very, very big deal. But the outcome is even more severe because what meant here was that the president could basically say, no to the democratic process, and say that I can do whatever I want to do. Um, what should have happened instead was some sort of a compromise, some sort of a constitutional convention to redraft the constitution to better fit the new democratic um, Russia. And the rest of the same goes as history choking parliament down until its ultimate surrender, an adoption of the new constitution which increased presidential powers, made Boris Yeltsin and other presidents who followed him constitutional dictators, or to put it bluntly, legal tyrants. Uh, much of all of this could have been avoided if the people had the slight understanding of what would be the outcome of the standoff. Uh, that not being the case, this era continues to plague the world under the new persona of Vladimir Putin, who also derives his power from that same Russian constitution enacted into law by Yeltsin in 1993. If only the people knew what Yeltsin was unleashing. And then came an interesting event, uh, New Year's Eve 1999. Um, as some of you may know, it is a Russian tradition that the president actually speaks to the Russian people on New Year's Eve every year. And usually there's an address about new policies and a rewrap of what happened previous year. Uh, but this one was really, really unusual because here uh, Boris Yeltsin uh, came to the television and actually announced his retirement and actually translated part of his speech here. He said, my dear friends, all my dear friends, tonight for the last time I'm speaking to you with a New Year greeting. But that is not all. Tonight for the last time I'm speaking to you as the president of Russia. I've made my decision. I've spent much time and effort contemplating on it. Today, on the day of the passing century, I'm going into retirement. But today I want to say something, something else. I want to apologize and ask for your forgiveness. Forgiveness for the fact that many of our dreams did not come true, for the fact that what seemed so easy uh, ended up so miserably painful. I want to apologize for those who believed that we could only take one jump from this totalitarian, tyrannical past into the new civilized future. With the accordance of the Constitution, when leaving the presidential post, I have signed an order of placing the presidential duties on the chairman of the government, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. He shall be the head of the state for the next three months until the election. And this is when the Russians first heard of who was Vladimir Putin. Um, he held a position, uh, uh, he was the prime minister before that, but he wasn't a very popular politician. And he actually, his first presidency was not a popularly won presidency, it was an appointment by Yeltsin. And this is kind of almost like a passing on of power from the king to his son, almost in the same way. And of course, one, one could write volumes about Vladimir Putin and his lengthy reign over the Russian Federation, from the beginning of a KGB officer to becoming the person of the year in Time magazine. Putin's life and career is full of interesting stories um, and surprises. However, there are also a number of questionable events that took place during Vladimir Putin's presidency. Um, and most of them did not come until the very end of 2008. Uh, suspicion among the citizens and international political observers all pointed to one single question. Will Vladimir Putin stay for the third term as president? So many the question was a fair one because of the dictatorial nature of the Russian leaders in history. However, there was a dilemma. The Russian constitution was in the way. Indeed, nothing in the Constitution allowed Putin to stay for more than two terms, and wide speculations of Putin's probable push for its amendment, or even total dismissal of the Constitution, became the routine talk among the ordinary Russians. But then, in a surprising move to everyone, Putin decided to take the position of a constitutionalist. When asked about the matter by the press, he firmly held the position that he will step down after two-term presidency. Surprising indeed, but Putin had a plan. A plan that would even make Yeltsin's dismissal of the parliament seem like a stroll on a red square amidst a peaceful Sunday afternoon. And Vladimir 
Putin's plan consisted of three major points. Uh, first, he needed to appoint somebody to the throne, the same way almost as Yeltsin did to Putin. And this is when the world first heard of Medvedev. Uh, however, notice that in the context of political power, nothing at all has changed. Medvedev was A, from the same political party as Putin, United Russia. B, the parliament was still largely controlled by the United Russia party. So nothing at all was changing, all he was doing was simply switching with another individual. Um, the second part of the plan was to actually not leave the political scene entirely, because Vladimir Putin still wanted to have the influence over the media. So he actually became the prime minister, so they literally swapped places with Dmitry Medvedev. Uh, and afterwards, it actually worked out brilliantly for him, because the Russian media started focusing more on Vladimir Putin than Medvedev. So even though Medvedev was now the president, you would see the news reports, you would have one report about Medvedev and followed by three reports of Vladimir Putin, you know, rescuing kittens, uh, flying geese out of the forest, you know, trying out new uh, uh, pancakes on uh, uh, Moscow Red Square. That it was, the media coverage was almost propaganda-like. And the third part of the plan was um, with the same mistake that Yeltsin was making. And Yeltsin obviously took a risk. What if, indeed, the people um, and the army sided with the parliament? during the Dr. Graf's constitutional crisis. Well, that wouldn't have ended well for Boris Yeltsin. So Putin decided to amend the constitution the legal way. And obviously, as soon as Dmitry Medvedev was in the office, they amended the constitution to allow two consecutive six-year terms as a president. And conveniently enough, it did not apply to Medvedev. So Medvedev stepped down after the four-year term, and Putin won the re-election in 2012, and is now serving a six-year term eligible for another six-year re-election. So we may have him, unfortunately, for a very, very long time. How many have time? OK. Um, I shall be brief um, for my other two points. Uh, the biggest question that I'm asked as a, as a Russian from Americans is, are Russian elections rigged? <coughs> That's kind of the main, the main question, how are they rigged? And the question is actually a little bit more complex than it is obvious. Um, I will answer in the following way. Yes, Russian elections are rigged, but not in the way in which you may think. So most people think of the rigged elections uh, as people making fake ballots, putting fake ballots in, so that's how the United Russia Party would win more and more and more votes. However, that's actually not the case. It's, it's the case in some small republics. That is true. There's like 107% of small republics that vote for, for Vladimir Putin, so over the population um, that actually lives there. But those are not enough to make a huge difference. Um, the major problem with Russian elections is the term that I call in framing. And it's an framing of the political sphere. Uh, and that means is that the competition has been picked out before the elections even start. Because if you actually look at the different parties that are participating in the Russian elections, you have the Communist Party, which wants to return to the Soviet Union. It's the second largest party in Russia. You have the LDPR, the Liberal Democratic Party of Russia, uh, had by, uh, well, led by the Vladimir uh, Drinovsky, who is a demagogue who believes that the United States is the ultimate devil and tests uh, chemical weapons over Russia. Um, so he wants to go to war with the United States. So no, no serious person is going to vote for that individual. And then we have the Just Russia, which is the so Socialist Party, but the Socialist Party that believes in modern progressive socialist principles. So who do you vote for? And then you have the moderate party, United Russia, for Vladimir Putin, who doesn't believe in socialism, doesn't believe in too much of an open free market, right in the middle of the road, the most moderate party ever. So what happens is the Russian polit political system doesn't allow uh, smaller parties to register. Um, and if, if you are, for example, someone who believes that Russia needs more federalism and an open market, there's no party that will represent your views. So you're forced as a, rational, as a, as a rational voter to vote for Vladimir Putin. That's the only rational choice. And, and the political aspect of it is in framed in that manner. And that's how the elections are, quote unquote, rigged. Um, I can talk about the infrastructure problems of Russia in the Q&A section. So if you have a question about it, please don't hesitate to ask in the end. Um, but for now, I rest my case, but I shall be back. Thanks.